Miranda Miller grew up right here in Gillette, um, went off to study at a university in a faraway state. If she had followed the path that too many of our UW students and Wyoming students um, follow, that would have been the end of her story, at least as far as Wyoming was concerned. But instead, after earning her bachelor's degree at Marietta College in Ohio and her master's degree at Ohio State, she came back to Gillette and joined the English faculty here at the college where she has taught since 2007. Uh, Miranda's area of expertise is English literature. And when we say that, you know, we think of the classics of a bygone era, you know, Charles Dickens and Mariah Edgeworth and William Shakespeare and, and so on. But the analysis of literature has expanded in recent times uh, to incorporate not only current writings, but also current artistic products, um, films, uh, internet sites, and so on. And, and so Miranda is actually part of this new wave of exciting analyses. She works on film, uh, writing and presenting on movies popular among America's young people. Uh, at the national meetings of the uh, Popular Cultural Association, Miranda has presented on the representation of gender uh, and bodies in the TV series Mad Men and uh, in, on the film Twilight. She's also analyzed one of the films of one of my favorite directors, uh, Performity and Prioritization in Steven Spielberg and his representation of race. Um, today, she's going to chase a slightly different genre, that of the horror film. Not one of my favorite genres, but uh, <laughs> Miranda tells me she just can't get enough of it. Um, and she will speak to us on the topic, Mother is Monster, Scary Single Motherhood in Contemporary Horror Films. Miranda. Thank you very much. Um, I've been asked many times how I came up with the topic for my presentation. As Dr. Flesher said, I am a horror film fan. It is my favorite genre. I watch many of them and have since I was young. And over the last several years, well over a decade, I've noticed a large number of single mothers popping up in these narratives. And I've basically bothered to turn a critical eye toward these movies and I turned my observation into a conference paper. Now I'm working on a book to um, hopefully publish one day, um, crossing my fingers. So I do believe it's important to take works of popular culture seriously. It's something that I focus on in my English courses with my English 1010 students. So before I delve more specifically into my argument, I do want to address the academic value of the horror film with you the reasons why I think it should be analyzed critically and not simply consumed as mere entertainment. Okay, so the case for analyzing horror films. First, horror films do hold up a mirror to our culture. They obviously show us what we fear and they reflect deeply ingrained societal anxieties. Post-World War II alien and monster movies are a very good example of this. They captured our culture's fear of communist invasion, the usurping of our American values by another dominant ideology, right? So this poster is from Invasion of the Body Snatchers, a film about seemingly ordinary people who were actually pod people instead, right? And that was a tremendous threat to us in that particular era. The other poster is from a film that might not be as familiar to some of you. It's from the film Hostel. Um, that was a film created following our involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan. Other movies included um, Touristas, Wolf Creek, The Ruins, and also two different sequels to Hostel. All of those films centered around that common theme. A group of young, naive tourists go to these countries and they're subsequently tortured and murdered by the locals. It's basically thought that these films tapped into our country's sphere of Afghanistan and Iraq-related backlash. Basically, what consequences would we suffer for our presence in these particular countries? And then finally, in that third statement, horror films obviously can make political statements, right? Certainly they contain social commentary. 
The most recent U.S. Census Bureau, I think this is 2011, indicates that the number of single mothers in our country is 10 million, which is nearly a threefold increase since 1970, and that increase obviously is a substantial one. And in the realm of popular culture, the increase in single mothers is especially observable in the horror film genre. So in my mind, what are horror films saying about single mothers? What kind of comment are they making about this particular type of motherhood? That's my area of interest. What are they suggesting about modern motherhood? To me, these films are making a powerful message or even mandate about what motherhood in the 21st century is supposed to look like. Um, more significantly, they are holding up a very large segment of the mother population for ridicule, and that is the single mother. So that's my essential argument. Um, according to the creators of these films, motherhood today is supposed to be traditional. So a woman needs to be coupled with a man, obviously. Motherhood needs to be nurturing, it needs to be self-sacrificing, but it's not painted that way in the films that I will discuss with you. And that is probably why the characters in these films are made to suffer in rather tremendous fashions. Um, and that is why single mothers appear so much in horror films. And it's a genre associated with peer, pain, excuse me, fear, anxiety, suffering, disgust, as opposed to other types of films, um, dramas, comedies. And to me, that is very problematic. So to me, it seems that contemporary horror filmmakers have presented us with something perhaps new to fear. They've given us another aberrant force to add to the canon of villainous beings. So we have the lone struggling mother with no access to a man's wallet. Is she another form of a monster? That's my question. All right, so before we explore the films that I've been analyzing for the past couple of years, I do want to offer you guys some context for my argument. The horror genre is rife with stock characters, which I've listed here, the top four. The bottom one is mine that I've sort of codified, so to speak. Um, these women and girls, obviously, are drawn in very one-dimensional fashions. Um, we have the virgin, the tramp, the damsel, the witch. These are also common types in literature. Beginning in the mid 20th century, around the time when women in our country were afforded more freedoms, you saw the emergence of these, very four, these four very distinct character types in American horror films. So we'll start by looking at the sexualized woman. And we can see this type in these three films, in particular, Cat People, The Birds, and Psycho. So we'll look at Cat People in a little more detail first. All right, this was a film that debuted in 1942, and that was a significant year historically in that we had men going abroad to fight in World War II, women taking their place in the factories, and traditional gender roles obviously being challenged. And maybe because of this, this film took a more staunchly traditional view on gender and female sexuality in particular. The plot line of this film, in case you're not familiar, is a little bizarre. A couple gets married and the wife refuses to consummate the marriage for fear, for fear excuse me, that she'll turn into a cat and kill her husband, all because of a folktale she heard as a child when she grew up in Serbia. So the suggestion here is that the female lead is a would-be sexual aggressor. And the essential message is that female sexuality is monstrous and has to be contained and eventually she dies for her crimes, so to speak. The other two films, The Birds and Psycho, are both Alfred Hitchcock masterpieces, of course, and they play on classic Oedipal anxieties, clinging mothers who are attached to their sons. In the case of The Birds, you have a female lead, Melanie, who starts off the film as very flirtatious, sexually aggressive, and it's thought that the attacks of the birds and the trauma she endures make her passive by the time the film ends. She is made docile and submissive. Um, she's punished for being overly sexual. Um, Psycho is a little bit different. Marion Crane's fate is much worse. I purposely used the same poster for this slide just to show you how overtly sexualized the advertising was when it came to 
Janet Lee's body. She played Marion Crane in the film. This is how she is dressed in the film's very famous opening scene. She just finished a meeting, so to speak, with her paramour. He's shown down there much smaller because his body is in what is selling the film, obviously. So she's initially introduced to us in her bra and her slip. And the last image of her in the film is um, her getting undressed, her getting completely naked, and then her getting into the shower, and then her promptly being murdered, right? So hers is a hyper-sexualization, the same sort of thing going on. All right, the second dominant character type is that of the possessed victim. In this case, we have two films, Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist. The central female completely lacks agency. One is impregnated by the devil. That's the film on the left, in case you didn't know that for some reason. And then in the other one, she's possessed by a demon. In this case, neither person is able to save herself. Things are enacted upon both of these women. In one case, it's actually a girl. And then we have the third common character type, the terrorized babysitter Halloween when a stranger calls. These were slasher films of the 1970s. These are often described as films that were a response to the tremendous success of the second wave women's movement. And it's thought that the very classic terrorized babysitter trope was a very visceral response to the number of married women who were entering the workforce in that particular era. So if American society could no longer legally ban women from entering the workforce, then maybe they could turn to a force like popular culture. So showing mothers the consequences of their absence from the home could maybe be just as powerful. Um, when a Stranger Calls made it very clear that children should not be left alone with babysitters and that film that children are murdered while mom and dad are away. They did reboot this film um, five or six years ago, and they did away with that element of the film. The children survived, perhaps because that plot wouldn't go down as easily for today's audiences, I don't know. And perhaps the most well-known female character type in horror films is that of the final girl. This was identified by Carol Clover, and she's a resourceful young woman who survives the massacre, and in some cases, she gets rid of the threat she ends up murdering the villain or the monster. She's always the last one standing by the time the film is over. Um, some final girls survive entire franchises. That's the case with Scream, which you see at the very end, Sidney Prescott. Spoiler alert, sorry. <laughs> You're gonna get a lot of those today. Um, she is a more empowering character type, but Clover notes that she also has some flat, one-dimensional qualities, so for example, She's almost always a virgin. Her sexually experienced friends tend not to survive the carnage, which would seem to suggest that things haven't changed that much over time. Female sexuality is consistently viewed as threatening. And obviously, I talked about that when I mentioned cat people, right? So we're coming full circle. All right. The horror genre still functions not necessarily to keep women in their place, but to make them feel profound guilt that the home is not the center of their activity anymore. And again, as I argue, the most dominant female type found in today's horror films is that of the single mother. And she has become something of a fixture in today's films. And she has a very problematic presence that we really must contend with. And there are several contemporary horror films in which we find her, so among them, the Sixth Sense, The Others, The Ring, Jennifer's Body, Dark Water, the reboot of A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Paranormal Activity Cycle, and Dark Water. And we'll look at all of these today. And all of these films feature fractured family situations that have so much tension that audience members have to start to wonder exactly who or what is supposed to be feared. Where does our central focus lie, with the ghost story or with the mother and her many problems. Um, standard horror affair features an obvious locus of fear, but this, these works of horror cinema over the last 15 years have positioned these female heads of households as equally capable of inducing fear as well. Haunted houses have become those homes that lack a traditional nuclear makeup, and the fright created by the film's marquee monsters is being rivaled by the fright created by these women as well, at least the way they're painted by these particular filmmakers. 
Um, the single mothers found in the horror films of the last decade or so also fall into two very rigid categories, the chronically absent mother and the mentally unhinged or even hysterical mother. The fact that they easily fall into two categories is also very telling. Much like the more traditional monster figures that populate horror films, many of these characters are written in a very one-dimensional fashion that simply doesn't resist rigid classification. You can easily categorize them, and they function simply as stock characters rather than more fully realized human beings or rounded characters, as we say in our English classes. Um, they also they do manage to draw the attention of a culture that's very strict in its definition of, of how a mother should behave, husbandless or not. So I do want to explore these single mother character types with you. So we'll start with the absentee mother. These particular films depict these mothers as unavailable to their children, obviously, and it's almost always because of economic imperatives, and that's standard fare in all of these films. One could say that these film directors are just reflecting our culture, showing us the very real home lives of many children today, but folding depictions of single motherhood within a film plot that revolves around terror, to me, makes this problematic. To what extent do the two become conflated? Terror and single motherhood, that's my question. Okay, so we'll start with The Sixth Sense. I do give you a brief plot summary in case you're not familiar with the movie. Um, I will have to spoil this film for you just for analytical purposes, I'm, purposes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's 15 years old, hopefully you've seen it before. You've had your chance, I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> So in this film, we're introduced to Cole. He is played by Haley Joel Osment. He infamously sees dead people, right? And because of this, his mother acquires the services of you know, a child psychologist. That's what we are led to believe initially as the story unfolds, because he needs help, all right? So the mother is played by Tony Collette. Her name is Lynn. Presumably, that's the most important family relationship in the film, although you wouldn't really know that based on screen time. Cole spends a vast amount of time with Dr. Malcolm Crowe, that's the child psychologist played by Bruce Willis. Um, Colette's character is the quintessential busy working mother, and the film's dialogue tells us that she has two jobs. And the first time we meet her, she is in a state of undress, which looks like this. This is seen in more than one of these films, and I'll show you this in another slide coming up soon. And she's basically bustling around her house to ensure that her son makes it out the door on time. And meanwhile, her son is already dressed for school and in his uniform that comes with a collared shirt, a tie, and a blazer that makes him look like a polished adult as opposed to her looking more disheveled, which is kind of an interesting inversion of, um, I guess, typical child adult roles in terms of how they dress. And then later in the film, we have Cole comforting his mother when she has a nightmare. It's loud enough to rouse him from his sleep. And that's also a very interesting reversal of the typical parenting scenario, but also a troubling one. We, as viewers, are kind of led to feel fear for Cole because the person we expect to be his ally above all others is somewhat disconnected from him. Um, her jobs keep her away from her child and she's also further distanced from him because she doesn't understand his struggle, this harassment that he faces from these ghosts. So, so much of the film is devoted to the Malcolm Crow and Cole relationship. And in the end, Cole isn't saved by the person who gave him life, his mother, but rather by someone who is dead. The Bruce Willis character, spoiler alert, is dead the entire time, right? Okay, sorry, there you go. <laughs> He thinks he's actually helping Cole, but every, in reality, Cole was the one who was helping him the entire time. All right, the next film I want to discuss with you is The Ring. This was made in 2002. This is a film about a videotape that kills people within seven days if they watch it. So the video has killed this woman's niece, and she's a journalist. She wants to investigate. She watches the film. Now she only has a week to live and then her poor son ends up watching it too. So now it's a race against time to save herself and her child. And this film features a similar scenario in that she's also a busy working mother, but unlike Lynn in The Sixth Sense, 
Rachel is a member of the professional class. She has a career, so she's not forced to work dead-end jobs in order to survive. But she's another mother type that our society holds up for ridicule because she's given up home and hearth for career. So our first view of Rachel is at her child's school. It is a place they cast as innocent and good, and then Rachel ruins everything by coming late to pick him up and interrupting the tranquil scene by cursing in a cell phone conversation with her boss on her cell phone, which her son responds to with this sort of like devastated look on his face. And because of this, viewers are immediately encouraged to pass judgment on this less than ideal mother. Um, the fact that her son, his name is Aiden, calls his mother Rachel rather than mom further con confirms that this is a very unconventional mother and son relationship. And much like Cole in The Sixth Sense, this absenteeism of his mother has also sent Aiden on a very quick trajectory toward adulthood. Um, on the morning of his cousin's funeral, Rachel, seen here, struggles to find her black dress that she needs for the occasion. And much like our first meeting of Lynn in The Sixth Sense, we are also treated to a couple half-naked shots of Naomi Watts looking for her clothing. And <laughs> meanwhile, we get to see the sun in a suit, just like in the other movie. So again, creating that parallel, showing a very adult child and um, a less than put together um, mother. So an inversion of those parent and child roles once again. And at their core, horror films focus on the crossing of boundaries, a collapsing divide between the living, the dead, the monstrous, the human, but what do we think of this willful abdication of the parental role to such a young boy? Can a transgression like this also provoke fear in audience members? Um, there's no question in this particular film that Rachel's devotion to her career is paramount and that investigating the videotape that seems to have killed her niece is initially done more for the sake of writing a good story for her newspaper job than for closure. But once she unravels the mystery of the tape, and once it becomes more important that she needs to save her own life, Rachel removes herself even further from her own son. We see less of Aiden in the movie at that point. And this results in Aiden watching the cursed videotape that destines its viewer to certain deaths in seven days because he was left unattended. And that's seen here. Um, this element of the film's narrative is commentary not only on the dangers of leaving your child unsupervised, but it's also a reminder to viewers, especially mothers in particular, that the television set, which he is sitting in front of, is the most harmful babysitter of all, right? I mean, here's its conclusion. Rachel finds herself in a well <laughs> with the body of the young girl who is responsible for creating this videotape, who we now know is a murder victim. It's an elaborate story to get there. I'm not gonna get into that, but in a significant character shift, Rachel ends up cradling this girl in the iconic pose of the Pieta, which is Western culture's foremost image of a mother mourning over the dead body of her child. Keep in mind, this is not her kid, but this is very intimate. Um, nowhere in the film does Rachel relate to her own child's body in such a loving and intimate manner. And this communion with the dead shows viewers a very maternal side of Rachel that really cannot be discerned for much of the film, especially not with her own child. And this maternity is very misplaced. We learn that the girl in the well isn't after a mother as much as another victim. And her son is the one to eventually tell her this. And perhaps he would have told her that earlier if he had sort of been shoehorned into her schedule in some way. All right. The next film I want to discuss is Jennifer's Body. This is a film about two best friends. Their friendship is eventually sort of fissured because of the demonic possession of one of the girls. Um, this film features not one, but two single mothers. So we'll start by looking at Amy Sedaris, who plays Amanda Seyfried's character's mother. Amanda Seyfried's character is named, appropriately enough, Needy, which seems allegorical in this case, right? So it points probably to several things, but maybe most importantly, her need of a mother. Um, two of the film's more anxiety-ridden scenes feature Needy alone in her house, desperate for her mother's presence, and I've included the dialogue beneath this particular one. So 
Needy is responding to some unfamiliar noises in her house. It's supposed to be empty, but it's not. She's talking with her boyfriend, Ship, on the phone. I'm all alone. I'm freaked out. Where's your mom? Swing shift. The absence of Needy's mother is basically set up as an expectation for viewers, and it's made pretty manifest in shots like this, which show Needy as a classic latchkey kid. And later in the film, as the demonic possession of her friend takes a toll on her well-being, Needy becomes much more emotive. This slide pairs with the dialogue, mommy, mommy, that she says in a very bewildered and frightened fashion. And at this point in the film, viewers are pretty much given license to levy a significant amount of blame on Needy's mother for the trauma that her daughter is feeling. Um, at least her presence in the house presumably would give some measure of comfort to her distraught daughter. Um, by the time this film is over, one of the female leads has been murdered, one has been hauled off to jail, all of this without any motherly supervision. So the absence of any parental presence is felt especially strongly in this movie, and no mothers are around. And much like Jennifer's Body, the 2010 remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street features not one but two single mothers as well. This is a classic film, um, the original version, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but in case you're not, um, the villain in this film kills people in their dreams so no one can fall asleep lest they be murdered. All right. um, this film also makes it a point to show us a latchkey kid, which we see here, as well as one of the single mothers going to work and essentially leaving her daughter as prey in a big <laughs> empty house. This image to me is interesting in that the character is not simply going across town to go to work. She's literally flying away from her daughter. She is a flight attendant, as we can see here. And we're told in the film's dialogue that she's catching a red eye to London, so she's literally putting a continent between her and her child. So it seems like a pretty strong statement's being made here about this motherly absenteeism once again. She's very, very far away from her kid. Um, the most interesting element of the remake, however, to me, is the choice they made in terms of character lineup. The reboot completely eliminates this character, Nancy's father. Nancy is the female lead. She's the final girl. Her father was played by John Saxon in the 1984 original. He is the town sheriff, one of them, and he's the main person who investigates all of the killings and is trying to figure out what exactly is going on in the town. The remake dispenses of him entirely and instead offers us the anxiety-ridden Connie Britton in his place and essentially further cements this ubiquity of the single mother in today's horror films, in my mind, anyway. All right, and then the last film featuring an absent single mother that, I, that I'd like to talk about today is part of the immensely popular paranormal activity cycle. There are five of those films out right now. They're basically films about demonic possession. This is the third installment. It's the origin story. We learn why the franchise's central female character, Katie, came to be possessed by demons. This particular film does offer up a male presence in the form of a boyfriend for the single mother. Here he is. This is Dennis. Um, viewers of the film note that he spends a substantial amount of time with the film's two daughters a lot more time than the mother does, which is pretty significant. When the mother is featured in the film, we see her often in these nighttime shots. She's very inactive, so here she is sitting in the bed, here she is cowering by the door, wondering what you know noise was just being made, and here she is sleeping. She's very far removed from the center of the haunting, which is her daughter's bedroom. The boyfriend is always at the center of this action, not because he's causing it, because, but because he wants to alleviate the fear of the children, um, neither of whom belong to him biologically, which is pretty interesting. And the final single mother type that I want to consider with you today is that of the hysteric. So I do think it's important that we know the definition of hysteria. It's a psychoneurosis marked by emotional excitability and behavior exhibiting overwhelming or unmanageable emotional excess. It's also important to know that this word is gendered feminine. Um, the root word hysteria comes from the Greek word that means ovaries in English. So 
It's also a mental state classification that throughout history has often been applied exclusively to women. That's very important to understand. Um, two horror films of the 21st century feature these emotionally excitable women whose behavior could be described as unstable by even the most casual of observers. And we'll start by looking at the others. This is a classic haunted house film. It is based loosely on The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, the classic novel. Um, we have this woman, Grace, her two children. They're living in a mansion in England. Her husband's away fighting in World War II. One child is starting to experience hauntings. She doesn't believe the child. I did have some shots of that opening imagery, which is very nice looking. Reminiscent of um, children's book illustrations, right? Meant to be lull you into a false sense of security before it's all shattered. Um, this is a obviously a very tight close up on her face, a vertical angle, which we typically don't see. Um, it obviously puts our world at a somewhat askew sort of angle here. Um, the opening is made even more disturbing by the director's next choice and angle. This is a Dutch angle shot, as is this. It tilts the world on its side and immediately tells us that we're entering the space of chaos. And this is significant in that this jarring scene is our very first introduction to Grace. She's the female lead and the single mother of two young children. And much of this film focuses on the gradual mental decline of Grace and we as viewers are treated to a veritable feast of images showing her descent into madness. And I believe I have 10 different slides of this, of her just looking rather crazy, to be blunt. Um, the whole premise of the film is whether the stories told by Grace's oldest child about ghosts haunting their house are indeed true, and ultimately we learn that Grace and her children are the ghosts that are haunting this house. The two children, un unfortunately, were killed by their mother, who the film suggests simply could no longer endure life without the children's father, who died fighting in World War II. So after taking the lives of her children, Grace then kills herself. So the ghosts that Grace's daughter saw in the house were actually the home's living inhabitants. So by the time the film closes, this single mother has successfully rid the home of any signs of life because she commits infanticide, suicide, and then drives out the human occupants of the home as well. So essentially viewers are left to conclude that single motherhood is basically this precursor to utter madness and ruin for anybody who is around her. Horror films show us what we as society fear the most, and when I screen these films, I begin to wonder if the ghosts and the monsters and the killers are just elaborate window dressing for stories that are ultimately much more focused on fractured families and the single mothers who are at the center of these particular families. And if these recent crops of scary movies are any indication, our dread of the non-nuclear family has simply not decreased at all in the last several decades. If these movies tell us anything, it is that the single mother is our modern monster. And that's the conclusion of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions, if there are any. My first question is, do you think that this is something that's centered on horror films specifically, or is that just the direction you went because that's the genre that you like to play with? Um, I watch a lot of films, not just horror films, and that is where I've most noticed the trend. And I guess that's where um, the genre where I find it to be most disturbing. Okay. I haven't seen it um, pop up so frequently in other genres. I don't know the exact number. Um, the, the directors for all of the films that I analyzed, they were all men, as were the producers, but I don't know about the writing team. That's actually a really good question. And in Hollywood in general, I don't know, I, I don't know the exact number, but I mean, it's a much more male-dominated world, certainly. So yeah, it's, it, it would be colored by that perspective. Isn't that just like the evolution of our society? I mean, would you prefer 
further, they still have, you know, men going to work and women in the kitchen. And then, oh, then they get... My qualm is that why are they... Why are they popping up in a genre that is so, I don't want to know if I want to say depraved per se, but I don't like the conflation of plots that are so ugly w with this particular type of motherhood. That's what, that's where it catches for me. And not so much that they're there in the film that way, but the way that they are. Right, 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 exactly. Their presence isn't an issue, because certainly that's, that is the world that we live in, but why are they rendered in this, in this fashion? Can you predict the next uh, female archetype? The next female Yeah, I mean, so these were, I mean, it seems like those were mid-2000s, and you start with the census figure that over the past 10 years or 20 years, or I forget what your starting point was, you know, tripling of single mothers, so what might be the next evil uh, horror film female lead? Will it be like the uh, female CEO? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be the anti-Katniss. I'm, I'm waiting for the pushback. People to get sick of the Katnisses and the... What's, who's the lead in Divergent? What was Tris? The non-Tris, the non-Katniss, for people to, to get irked with that super powerful, insular female, and for it to be the non-that, to see how that pops up in horror. Even, even Katniss and her mother set up a similar situation, though, because we have single mother who completely collapsed after her husband's death, and the story is about the girl who became the parent because her mother couldn't. Right, right. That's true. Thank you very much for it. We're going to take a 15-minute break. There are still juice and coffee. You don't stop.